ammonia reactor. So both enters at high pressure, almost 140 bar pressure, and a temperature of 450 Kelvin. Introduced into this ammonia reactor. Typical ammonia reactor is like a plug flow reactor. In the ammonia reactor, in, sorry, in the urea reactor, ammonia reacts with carbon dioxide, forms ammonium carbamate. Ammonium carbamate further converts to urea and water. So, <clears throat> typical conversion we can achieve in urea reactors is around 70%. So, 30% of reactants, 30% uh, of the uh, stream leaving from the urea reactor will be unconverted reactants, predominantly ammonia, CO2 and ammonium carbamate. So we have to separate these unreacted reactants from the urea. So unreactants are ammonia, CO2 and urea. And we know that how do we separate a simple principle? We know that urea at atmospheric pressure, at atmospheric temperature, will be in the solid form. Whereas ammonium carbamate, ammonia, CO2, they will exist as a gaseous form at atmospheric pressure, at atmospheric temperature. Sorry, ammonia and CO2 exist as a gaseous form at atmospheric pressure and atmospheric temperature. Even if, although ammonium carbamate can exist in the liquid form, but that will decompose very fast, that will decompose very fast into ammonia and CO2. So that's why immediately after leaving the urea reactor, the product stream undergoes through pressure reducing process, side by side heating. Why we have to heat? Urea at the atmospheric pressure at atmospheric temperature it will be in the solid form. We wanted to make sure it is in liquid form for the transportation purpose. So there will be intermediate heating while reducing the pressure. So first we'll use expansion valve in the gradual redu reduction of the pressure. The reason for the gradual reduction of the pressure is if you suddenly release the pressure or suddenly compress it, ammonium carbamate can form as a crystals. So that can ammonium carbamate crystals can be a dangerous thing. So that's why the pressure will be released very gradually from 140 bar to 20 bar, then heated, they again released to one bar pressure. So, so finally we get urea solution. The urea solution has water. So we wanted to make it concentrated like a molten salt. So we have, we have here, we have here the evaporator, vacuum evaporator. This is the evaporator, vacuum evaporator. So this vacuum evaporator, you will definitely uh, see in, you might have less learned about this evaporation process either in heat transfer course or process equipment design. So just uh, uh, it's typical heat exchanger with vacuum applied, that is the vacuum evaporator. So usually this vacuum evaporator operates at 660 centimeters of mercury vacuum. So after this evaporation, you will get the molten tank, then it introduced into the prilling tower. I have explained in the last class, typical prilling tower looks like a shower of liquid uh like shower like a liquid uh, like a shower what we use like the spray jet through the spray jet small small droplets of uh, urea like urea liquid droplets will fall from the bottom the air is supplied and heat transfer between cold air and hot urea solution urea droplet heat transfer takes place and solidification of urea granules will take place that way you get the urea granules now what we have is ammonia CO2, ammonia and CO2. These are the unreacted reactants. These needs to be recycled. These needs to be recycled. Remember that we have reduced the pressure and the pressure here is one atmosphere or between one to 20 atmospheric pressure. The gases pressure here is one to 20. 
because uh, some of the gas is coming at 20 bar here, some of the gas is coming at 1 bar here, so it would be intermediate pressure. Whereas we are supplying ammonia here and CO2 here is almost at 140 bar pressure. 140 bar pressure. So before we recycle them, we need to compress it because we need to make sure both are at same pressure before we introduce. So we need to compress it. So if you compress it, if you compress it, what will happen is if you suddenly compress it or suddenly release the pressure, the ammonium carbamate, the carbamate will tend to form or the liquefied, the liquid supposed of uh, the ammonia CO2 reaction will happen, carbamate will form and carbamate crystals can form the carbamate crystals can form. In any compressor, in any compressor, compressor means what? You are basically pushing the gas at very high pressure. If you have any crystals, two things can happen. Abrasion, abrasion between the crystals and the surface will happen. And also the ammonium car carbamate crystals can be highly corrosive. So because of that, straight away, we will not be able to recycle. Straight away, we will not be able, to, we, we will not be able to recycle or we cannot recycle as such, compress it and recycle it. So in the old, in the old uh, urea industries, urea industries, they used to find a way to utilize this ammonia and CO2 rather than recycling it. In the modern industries, in the modern industries, so that's why the typical old process are once throughput process. Once throughput process means unreacted reactants are not able to recycle back once throughput only. So in the old, some of the industries in the old industries used to just utilize the ammonia and CO2 for some other purpose instead of recycling back. But in the modern industries, <coughs> they have developed a different technique to recycle this ammonia and CO2, to recycle to ammonia and CO2. So what is this way? So when you when you <clears throat> when you compress it, when you compress it, the reaction between ammonia and CO2 will happen, and some amount of carbamate will form. In a when you recycle it, we have ammonia and CO2, and some amount of ammonia reacts with some amount of CO2 can form the carbamate. <coughs> carbamate. Now, let's let's take a simple uh, let's take a, a simple uh, phenomena here. Suppose we have ammonia, we have CO2 and we have carbamate. We have ammonia and we have CO2 and we have carbamate and we know this is a this is a reversible reaction. Reversible reactions means at any instance all the three components will form and there is a chance there is a highly highly possibility of the chemical reaction equilibrium can happen. There's a highly possibility or always happens of a chemical reaction equilibrium. So if you have ammonia, CO2, or uh, even though ammonia and CO2 reacts and forms carbamate, ammonia and CO2 will not completely convert because this is a reversible reaction. Some amount of carbamate decomposes back. So at equilibrium state, you have ammonia, you have CO2, and you have carbamate. At equilibrium means what? This concentration after retaining the equilibrium, the concentration of ammonia, the concentration of CO2, and the concentration of carbamate will be remain constant, right? Although there is a reaction happens between ammonia and CO2, because of this recycle, recycle reaction, so reversible reaction, there is a equilibrium state exists at some point of time. What point of time we call it as equilibrium? After that point of time, the concentration of ammonia, the concentration of CO2, and the concentration of carbamate will remain constant, will remain constant. Suppose if I remove, if I remove some amount of ammonia from this, let's say if I remove, we have an equilibrium condition and at equilibrium condition, we have some amount of some concentration of CO2, some concentration of uh, ammonia and some concentration of carbamate, all of the concentration. Let's say from this equilibrium, I have removed some amount of ammonia. I have disturbed the equilibrium. I have removed some amount of ammonia. I have disturbed the equilibrium. What will happen? Can any guess from the students? What will happen? I have an equilibrium mixture. I have disturbed the equilibrium. How I disturbed? I have removed 
So some of the ammonia from this. What will happen? Any student, any guess from the students? Please think about it. Please think about it. If I disturb if I disturb the equilibrium, will the system will again want to reach the equilibrium or not? If I disturb the equilibrium, will the system again wants to come back to the equilibrium state or not? Because I haven't changed the temperature pressure. So these two are remain same. Temperature pressure remains same. If I disturb the equilibrium, will the system wants to come back to the equilibrium or not? Can that be answered by anyone? Yes, sir, it will come in equilibrium. Yes. So what should happen? Uh, so to come to equilibrium state, what should happen? The concentration of ammonia should increase to the, from the uh, reduced value to the previous value or not? The car carbamate concentration will decrease and the concentration of ammonia will increase and CO2 also. Very good. That is the perfect answer. So if I remove some amount of ammonia, the system again wants to come back to the equilibrium. So since CO2 concentration remains same, the carbamate has to decompose into ammonia and CO2. The carbamate has to decompose into ammonia and CO2. That way, to increase the concentration of ammonia, the carbamate has to decompose again to reach the equilibrium state. Thank you. Uh, so if I remove some amount of ammonia, the carbamate decomposition will happen. Equilibrium gets disturbed and leads to the decomposition of carbamate. So how do we how do we remove this ammonia? How do we remove the ammonia? We can we can strip ammonia with help of CO2. We can strip ammonia with help of CO2. Suppose we have a gases. Suppose we have a gases where ammonia is only present. Suppose we have ammonia and CO2. If I do the stripping process, if I do the stripping process with the help of a liquid CO2, these are the gas and this is the gas. And if I pass uh, liquid CO2 through this, if I pass liquid CO2 through this, ammonia tend to react. Since ammonia reacts to CO2 very fast, it will tend to absorb. It will tend to absorb into this one very faster. It will tend to absorb into this system very faster. That way, with help of CO2, we can do this stripping. So if I have an equal mixture of ammonia, CO2 and carbamate, if I just pass through some liquid CO2 through this, then I can extract some of the ammonia from here. I can extract, I can remove some of the ammonia from here. That way, the carbamate decomposes back. So the modern processes, you just like this. The modern process, typical modern process follows this route. <clears throat> ammonia will be supplied in excess, will be supplied in excess. That way they can make sure the complete conversion of CO2 takes place in the urea reaction. That way the complete conversion of CO2 will take place in the urea reaction. We in the modern industries they will supply excess amount of ammonia than the stoichiometrically required. So the CO2 will become limiting reactant. So when you supply one thing excess and CO2 in the limiting reactant, even though you have the 70% conversion, you can almost consume whatever amount of CO2 available there. <clears throat> so ammonia and ammonia, let, let's, let's, let's say the CO2 is completely consumed. Then we have ammonia and water, ammonia and water, urea and carbamate in the urea and carbamate in the the urea reactor leaving stream because CO2 is completely consumed. 
So basically, we are supplying less than stock emitted liquid CO2 so that we can consume complete CO2. So, <clears throat> so in the the stream leaving the urea reactor, we will have ammonia, water, urea, and carbonate. Now here, it is passed. It 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 goes to the stripping stripper. So in the stripper, we will basically supply the CO2. Basically, we supply the CO2. The CO2 takes whatever ammonia is present. The CO2 takes whatever ammonia is present. As ammonia going, the carbonate further decomposes. As ammonia transferring, the carbonate further decomposes. That way, when the stream leaving the stripper, we'll have only ammonia and CO2. We'll have only ammonia and CO2. So this is ammonia gas, and here we have ammonia and CO2 gas. Then the reaction, the, re the mixes with the reactant and goes to the carbonate condenser. Again, they cycle back. This way, the complete utilization of ammonia takes place. The complete utilization of ammonia takes place. That way, we get the urea solution out, and all the unreacted reactants goes back. So, how do we achieve this stripping and reaction followed? So, the modern industries they use this type of reactor followed by a stripper. Reactor followed by a stripping section. So here. The reactor. This is the reactor. This is the reactor. This is the reactor. And typical like heat exchanger type, heat exchanger type stripping section will be used. Heat exchanger type uh, stripping section will be used. And you can see the liquid. <coughs> uh, the the liquid for flows like the liquid flows like a just falling film. Just for flows like a film. The liquid. This is the tube. This is the tube. A liquid just flows like a film. Liquid just flows like a film, and the gases pass through this. The gases pass through this. That way, we can achieve more amount of uh, more amount of mass transfer through this one. So this is like a typical falling film evaporator. If you see any evaporator, this is called falling film evaporator. Falling film evaporator. Falling film evaporator. So this urea reactor looks like a falling film evaporator. So in the evaporator we have a free space and we have a heat exchanger. But in this, this is used as a reactor. The free space is used as a reactor, and heat exchanger part is used as a stripper. That way they are able to achieve the reaction immediately followed by the stripping. Because we need to maintain the reaction and stripping at same pressure. We need to carry out the reaction and stripping at the same pressure. That's where they join both. They join both. I hope you're able to understand. But if you get any doubt, please ask me. I'm happy to answer. This is another type of uh, reactor where they join reactor and stripper. And here we have a reactor separately, and we have the stripper separately. So this is uh, another design of urea reactor followed by the stripping section they can use. So that's the way we can achieve the complete conversion of ammonia in the urea reactor by supplying excess ammonia and by stripping with CO2. So that way we're able to completely consume all the reactors. So most of the modern industries follow this route. Most of the modern industries follow this route. But however, there are some steel industries we still using the one throughput process. Still they using the one throughput process, but very very less, very very less. Most of the industries follow this technology to complete conversion of reactants. So that's all about urea process. So I have discussed um, I have discussed uh, what is the process, what is the thermodynamics, what are the old industries looks like and what are the modern industries looks like and how to achieve the equilibrium. So please, please go through this and please also read the textbook which I have given. So if you get any doubt, I will be very, very happy to answer your doubts. So I will just wait for a few seconds. If we have any questions, I can answer. Otherwise, I will move to next topic. Students, if you have any questions on the urea process, you may ask me. Otherwise, I will move to the next process. I hope I am giving 
some information which giving you some excitement or something that you are learning this will be really helpful if you visit any process industries or if you work in industries some of the details i'm giving also i'm telling you why we are studying mass transfer why we are studying react engineering why we are studying heat transfer why we are studying mechanical operations i'm trying you can see all the process involved all these core subjects and these are very very important subjects and all the industry industries use just these processes So I, I assume that none of your questions. Uh, so I'll move to the next topic. So today we'll talk about uh, the next topic is production of nitric acid. This is another important chemical which is used in most of the industries, especially fertilizer industries. Fertilizer industries uses nitric acid. <coughs> nitric acid was initially produced uh, that is around uh, second world war time they produced from the saltpeter and chili saltpeter that is from the potassium nitrate and sodium nitrate initially nitric acid was produced from the these two these two are available in the directly available in the undergrounds so if it is to mine these raw materials and they used to react with sulfuric acid to produce nitric acid saltpeter or chili saltpeter is used to produce the nitric acid and these two are directly available as a uh, as a raw materials in the underground so they used to mine these materials and they used to react with sulfuric acid to produce the nitric acid typical reaction typical reaction the sodium nitrate react with sulfuric acid and produces nitric acid that is the very very simple reaction but with the invention or with the rapid development of hydrocarbons that is uh, uh, <clears throat> rapid rapid invention on the hydrocarbon productions the amount of ammonia produced has also increased amount of ammonia produced also increase at the same time at the same time the sources for these nitrates also reduced as upon the invention of hydrocarbons ammonia production has increased greatly because most of the hydrocarbons do contain nitrogen uh, nitrogen as a some of the um, what called inert material so that whatever nitrogen is there in the hydrocarbons they is utilized for the ammonia production process like i showed i, I showed you methane uh, syngas production from there only nitrogen is coming and hydrogen is coming so the ammonia ammonia production has increased greatly at the same time these nitrates kno3 and so nno3 the nitrates and the resources are depleting the uh, nitrates resources are depleting so the the new route the modern industries following this route the, in, to produce nitric acid the modern industries are following the ammonia oxidation route modern industries are following the ammonia oxidation route the reason is with the <clears throat> with the discovery of hydrocarbons with the with the rapid growth of rapid invention of a rapid growth of petroleum refineries the ammonia production rate also increased also at the same time the resources for kno3 and sodium nitrate has greatly reducing especially after world war 2 so then they started this invented this reaction and following most of the current industries are following this route ammonia oxidation route just one second
sorry students so the current industry follows this ammonia oxidation route let us see what is this ammonia oxidation route and what are the things we need to take care ammonia reacts with oxygen produces nitric oxide no and 6s2 ammonia oxidation in the ammonia oxidation ammonia reacts with oxygen and produces no and water now another important thing another important uh, reaction also happens ammonia reacts with oxygen and produces nitrogen and water now you can see the gibbs free energy for well, this is less than the gibbs free energy for this the gibbs free energy for this is the nitrogen production reaction is lower than the nitric oxide nit no production so this is more favorable this is more favorable than this if you do if you do the oxidation if you do oxidation simple oxidation reactor at any temperature if you bring ammonia and if you bring oxygen come comes in contact with these two at any temperature most likely what will form is nitrogen because this is more favorable than this one the bottom reaction is more favorable than this one so that is the trick so what is the way we can avoid it? what is the way we can avoid this so that we wanted this one what is the way we can avoid we can avoid this so that we wanted this reaction so if you wanted to alter the reaction pathway there is only one possibility is by utilizing a catalyst if you don't utilize catalyst you will get you are going to get nitrogen in the ammonia oxidation reaction we are not going to get the nitric oxide so if you want to get if you want to make sure this reaction happen so we need to alter the reaction pathway we need to alter the reaction pathway the only way we can alter the reaction pathway is by using the catalyst by using the catalyst so this is the typical required reactions that the reactions what we wanted to produce um, nitric acid is ammonia should react with oxygen and form nitric oxide then no reacts with Uh, oxygen and produces NO2. The NO2 reacts with water and produces the HNO3. HNO3. So these are the reactions we wanted. These are the reactions we wanted. There are second reaction, third reaction are very very uh, very very simple, very very simple. So the there is no major uh, major major hassle. in the second reaction so so the so here this is the as i showed you this is the important reaction nitric oxide <coughs> now all are if you can see all are exothermic reactions any oxidation for that matter any oxidation reaction is an exothermic reaction so this is exothermic reaction this is exothermic reaction now and all are all are irreversible reactions all are irreversible reactions all are irreversible reactions so we don't have any much problem with uh, pressures we don't need any high pressures if it is only reversible reaction to push the forward reaction better we need high pressure so we don't need any much high pressure here that's what the unless unless the catalytic catalytic reaction requires high pressure we don't need to apply any much 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 high pressure here so these are the reaction simple reactions so whenever we have this uh, reaction with water that can be done by in the absorption tower itself whenever we have water as one reactant whenever we have water as one reactant that reaction can always done in a simple absorption column simple absorption column so let's see what is the way we can we can get nitric oxide rather than nitrogen 
is if you use platinum catalyst, if you use platinum catalyst, there is a there is a there is a this ammonia oxidizes into nitric oxide. If you don't use platinum catalyst, this is going to form nitrogen and C6H2. This is going to form nitrogen and H2. Just, just that is the important difference. Based on the equilibrium, the spontaneity of ammonia oxidation towards nitrogen is highly favorable. To alter the reaction pathway, the ammonia oxidation carries carried out in the in the presence of platinum catalyst. So a platinum catalyst. And here, this is very, very quick reaction. This is a very quick reaction, very short, uh, quick reaction. See, this is uh, irreversible reactions, irreversible reaction. So it is always, as the temperature increases, the conversion increases. As the temperature increases, conversion increases because there is no backward reaction. If you have a backward reaction, then a temperature increases, there is a uh, backward reaction dominates, but that problem is not there. So we can use high temperatures and short residence time. We need to use short, short residence time. Now the platinum, the platinum catalyst, you might know by this time, the platinum is very, very weak metal, mechanically very weak. The platinum is very mechanically very, very weak metal. So it's always need some support material. This always needs some support material. So rhodium, rhodium is used as a support material. So rhodium support, this is a rhodium support, then they coat platinum layer. They coat platinum layer on top of this rhodium. Now, how to achieve this short residence time? How to achieve this short residence time? If 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 this is in, a, in the form of particles, if this is in the form of particles, uh, let's say you have a platinum, platinum the particles, the catalyst. If the catalysts are, if the catalysts are uh, made as a particles, if catalysts are made as a particles, we cannot achieve short residence time because we have a tortuous path. We have a zigzag path. If you have a packed bed catalyst, we always have a tortuous path, zigzag path. Zigzag path means we cannot achieve the short residence time. If you keep it as a fluid agent bed reactor, if you keep it as a fluid agent bed reactor, the particles are flows, the particles are suspended, the particles are suspended. So in the, when the particles are suspended, we can achieve short residence time. There is no problem with the short residence time, but still we cannot use fluid agent bed reactors for this one. Can any any student guess why we cannot use fluid as a bed reactor if you have a part of platinum catalyst, platinum based catalyst? Any guess from the students? If I use catalyst particles as a fluidized bed, the platinum based catalysts are not suitable or not preferred to use as a fluid as a bed reactor. Any such any guess from the students why we cannot use? Quick thought, what happens if the particles are fluidized? I will give a clue. I already give a clue. The platinum is very weak, mechanically very weak. Please think about it. Please think about it. In case of packed bed, the particles are stationary, so there is no problem. But I'm saying that when the particles sent to move, there's a problem. What problem would happen? Just think about it. any any size, any any answer from the students. Pressure might be required more. Pressure. If I put pressure, uh, the fluidization velocity will be required more. No. If I put more pressure, the fluidization velocity will be more. So pressure is not a concern here. In the fluidization, can particle tend to hit each other?
in fluidization will particle tend to hit each other because one particle is moving other particle is moving yes or no one particle and the particle this is moving and this is moving is there any chance of attrition between the particle is there any chance of attrition between the particles high chance in a fluid bed reactor there is a very high chance that the particle tend to hit each other when particle tend to hit each other what will happen the layer of platinum usually comes out because even though you coat it it is not very strong because it is interaction between platinum with any other metal is very very less so we cannot cross link we can never cross link the platinum we can only simply coat a small layer so if i use fluid as a bed reactor because there is a high chance of attrition between the particles whenever there is a attrition between the particles there is a possibility of peeling off of the platinum material on the surface we cannot use fluid as a bed reactor so we cannot use packed bed reactors so what 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 the only possibility since it is a short residence time since it's a short residence time they make they make they make mesh kind of thing they make a mesh kind of thing so the rhodium the platinum coated rhodium made as a wires small wires and those wires are made as a mesh the made as a mesh see this is the typical platinum coated rhodium catalyst you can see they made like this so if we arrange so this is the reactor and this is the one layer of mesh and the layer of mesh and the layer of mesh that way they will make the multiple layers of the mesh the mesh is nothing but the rhodium the platinum coated rhodium made as a wires and those wires are used to make the mesh and that mesh is supported so this way when the reactant gases flow over this when the reactant gases flow over this you can achieve very short residence because the pore size between this is very high the the the, the, the gas can easily flow then only the residence time short residence times can be achieved the very very short residence very short means less than like in a few seconds so that fast the reaction is so that's why they made as a meshes also called as these meshes also called as gauzes i don't know exactly proper way of pronunciation so the gauzes you can see gauze cloth we say right whenever we have the bandages when we want to apply the bandages we have a gauze cloth so they also made a typical the platinum coated rose rhodium wires made in this meshes or gauzes and those will be used in the used as a catalyst in the ammonia oxidation reaction so that is the important feature of this ammonia uh, ammonia oxidation reactor one of the important feature of the ammonia oxidation reactor is that the catalyst platinum is coated on rhodium and made as a wires and the wires is converted as a mesh and that meshes will be used like a trace so this is the uh, typical uh, ammonia oxidation reactor this is the typical ammonia oxidation reactor looks like so we have they supply feed they supply feed from the top they supply feed from the top that is that is ammonia and oxygen is supplied from the top and they are allowed to react it through this they allow to react it uh, through this through this uh, meshes the gauzes through this one and very fast with with they supply very high flow rates so that will just pass through this gauzes gauzes and that way you will get the nitric oxide nitric oxide will come out from this ammonia oxidation reactor ammonia oxidation reactor since this is exothermic reaction lot of heat will be regulated and thin this is an irreversible reaction we don't need any intermediate cooling because at a higher temperature higher the conversion so we don't have to bother about the reducing the temperature in the reversible reaction we need intermediate cooling because high react high temperature favors the backward reaction so we need intermediate cooling but whereas here we don't need any 
intermediate cooling and also the water uh, the water present here the water present here will be in the vapor form because the temperature is very very high so that we will get the nitric oxide and water vapor both comes out as a gases both comes out as a gases so now so that's what i talked about the first reaction ammonia reacts with oxygen and forms the nitric oxide and 6 uh, 6h2o now the next one is nitric oxide reacts with oxygen and produces the no2 nitric oxide reacts with oxygen and produces the nitrogen dioxide no2 so here you can see <coughs> this is non catalytic reaction nitric oxide oxidation is a non catalytic reaction non catalytic reaction now <coughs> now one important feature we need to understand no2 reacts with oxygen and forms no2 no react with oxygen forms no2 there is one more possibility also possible that is no reacts with oxygen and forms n2o4 n2o4 this is also possible both are be possible now if you see the equilibrium studies if you see the equilibrium studies at different temperatures at a different pressures equilibrium studies at different temperatures and different pressures different pressures at at low temperatures you can see at the low temperature n2o4 n2o4 formation is higher at low temperature n2o n2o4 n2o4 see this is the n2o4 curve this is the n2o4 curve n2o4 curve at low temperatures until until 400 degree centigrade until 400 degree centigrade you can see <coughs> at lower than 300 n2o4 is higher than no2 content at temperatures lower than 2 300 degree centigrade so 300 kelvin at temperatures lower than 300 kelvin n2 n2o4 concentration is higher and you can see you can see here this is no2 no2 concentration is lower but when it crosses when it crosses roughly 320 kelvin and no2 dominates no2 dominates but at temperatures close to 400 kelvin at temperatures close to 400 kelvin no2 will be dominating no2 is very high and n2o4 is very very low so that means the equilibrium data suggests that we need to carry out this process at temperatures between between 400 to 500 kelvin 400 to 400 kelvin if you go beyond again if temperature increases again n2o4 concentration increases n2o4 concentration increases so whether at one bar pressure whether at one 10 bar pressure the trend will be similar but higher pressure that will be shifted at higher pressure there will be the temperature will be little bit shifted but there is no other difference even at low pressure at high pressure same trend is observed if increase pressure the temperature will be slightly shifted to right hand side slightly shifted to right hand side so if you want to carry out the reaction at atmospheric pressure then the preferable temperatures are between 400 to 500 kelvin 400 to 500 kelvin so this is oxidation reaction and this is exothermic reaction exothermic reaction so although this is although although this is a uh, irreversible reaction although this is a irreversible reaction still we cannot run this at high temperatures we cannot run this at high temperatures if we run at high temperatures although there is no problem with conversion of this but the this reaction favors the equilibrium study showed that this reaction favors this reaction favors now one important concept i am highlighting in these last four classes is that whenever you design a reactor whenever you design uh, a reaction system at what temperatures what can what pressures we need to operate it is totally depends upon the thermodynamic equilibrium and kinetics so that's it's very very important thermodynamic equilibrium and the kinetics are very very important so once you know the kinetics and thermodynamic equilibrium we can pretty much tell that yes this reactor has to be operated at this condition 
So why we are operating at this pressure at this temperature entirely depends upon this thermodynamic equilibrium conditions. And how fast, how slow we can achieve that is based on the kinetics. So these are very, very important concepts. So if I give a, some new reaction to you, if I give a, some new reaction to you and I say what temperature I should operate, then you should immediately find out what are all the different possible reactions can happen. Then if you do a simple, simple, very simple, if you see uh, chemical reaction equilibria, chemical reaction equilibria in your thermodynamics chapter, if you take that one, there are very, very simple formulation. There are very, very simple formulations are there to find out this equilibrium conception. In Cape course, I will also teach you using Aspen how to get this uh, thermodynamic equilibrium data to study for different reactions that I will teach in the second part of uh, Cape course. So once you know this, you know your reactor, what, what to be done for reactor, what is required, intermediate cooling required or not required, what is the metal thickness required, whether corrosion is important or not. So all these factors I'm emphasizing so that you will, once you know this basic details, you should be able to tell quickly that yes, I need this, I don't need this and all the factors you should be able to understand because, you know, because of the time constraints, I cannot cover all the process industries. I'm covering important process industries and I'm highlighting all the basic details so that if you take a new process industries, you should be able to easily understand uh, all these basic details by yourself. That is what my uh, aim. So from this, uh, uh, nitric oxide to NO2 and N2O4, this is the equilibrium data. <clears throat> so, so this is the typical process flow sheet. This is the typical process flow sheet of a nitric acid production process. This is the typical process of a nitric acid production process. So we get liquid ammonia from the ammonia process plant. Now, in this case, in this case, all are in the gas state. Ammonia in the gas, ammonia in the gas, oxygen in the gas form. Then you get nitric oxide in the gas state. Then you also get the vapor state. Vapors, water vapor will come. So we have liquid ammonia. This has come from the ammonia plant. And that needs to be, that, that all goes through evaporator because we wanted to convert gaseous form of ammonia, gaseous form of ammonia. So this evaporator, it will undergo to the simple evaporator where the liquid is converted to vapor or gas. The liquid is converted to vapor or gas. Now sometimes this ammonia uh, during the process, the liquid ammonia during compression or evaporation, it can contain some water droplets. It can contain some water droplets or oil droplets because compressors use some oils. Compressors use oils, so sometimes water leak. So the water droplets can form. So those water droplets or oil droplets are these are filtered. These are all filtered here. These are all filtered here. So we get ammonia vapors or ammonia gas. Similarly, we have air. We have air is pumped. The air is compressed or pumped through this one. Then uh, again, heated to the required temperature because this favors at high temperature. So again, heated to high temperature because the ammonia is coming at high temperature. The air also be at high temperature, and both enters, both enters the, uh, both enters the, <coughs> both enters the ammonia oxidation reaction, ammonia oxidation reactor, ammonia oxidation reactor. As I said. As I said, uh, it will be it will be like a meshes or gauges of the uh, platinum coated rhodium gauges or meshes are used, and quickly spontaneous reaction quickly reaction happens on this catalyst surface, and this way you will get this way you will get uh, you will get nitric oxide and uh, water vapors will come, and this is. This is a uh, highly exothermic reaction. So, whereas, whereas, uh, sorry, whereas this one needs to be operated at be between these temperatures. This has to be operated at this temperature, right? Here, the the, the, the gases leaving the ammonia oxidation reaction will be at very high temperature because this is highly exothermic reaction. This is highly exothermic reaction. Minus nine nine zero seven kilojoules per mole. 
and also to make it short residence time they also operated very high temperatures so almost like 1200 kelvin they operated at 1200 kelvin so these are the reactor conditions so this will be at very very high temperature so we need to cool down to 400 kelvin because the next reaction nitric oxide to oxide reactions uh, favorable at 400 kelvin so we need to cool down so they remove the heat they remove the heat this is boiler feed water bfw boiler feed water so we have a coils we have internal coils like heat exchangers through this coil they supply water the water is input and the heat is removed and we get a steam outside we will get a steam outside and the steam goes to the this steam uh, this steam goes to the wherever uh, energy generation required or whenever uh, wherever different different purposes this steam sir this steam is used in the in the because usually this all industry is connected ammonia nitric acid all are connected into together with refineries so this steam will be sent to the some other uh, process so although we cannot cool immediately we cannot cool all the temperatures so again once again we will have a, a boiler feed water is sent and it converted to steam so some of the amount of heat will be removed some of the heat will be removed and still it undergoes to the condenser still it undergoes to the condenser so that the finally will bring back the temperatures around 400 to 500 kelvin over oh, repeating the nitric oxide comes out and water vapor comes out it will be at very very high temperature because it is exothermic reaction so the heat is removed because the next reaction nitric oxide reacts with oxygen and converts the nitrogen dioxide and more to that that should be operated at 400 to 500 kelvin so the temperature has to be reduced that's why we have a series of heat exchangers are used series of heat exchangers are used followed by condenser so that you will have the so that you will have the nitric oxide at very low temperature nitric oxide at the low temperature so <clears throat> now you can see two important reactions nitric oxide reacts with oxygen and forms no2 the formed the produced no2 react with water and produces hno3 so often these two reactions these two reactions done in the same place these two although we can do separately but these two reactions can be done at same place that way we can maintain that 400 to 500 kelvin temperature easily the here the condensed uh, here you can see it goes to this whatever whatever nitric oxide comes here whatever nitric oxide comes here just for time being uh, don't worry about this i will explain so the nitric oxide comes here comes here and is supplied supplied into this absorber now the air is introduced from the bottom the air is introduced from the bottom air is introduced from the bottom and the cold water is introduced from the top the cold water is introduced from the top so oxygen is introduced air is see air is introduced from the bottom and from the middle <coughs> from the middle n vote is introduced uh, from the middle n vote is introduced now you say why is this weak acid weak acid is formed why is this weak acid formed because here we have no and we have water we have no and we have water and since we are introducing air since we are introducing air some amount of oxygen also present some amount of oxygen also present and this no reacts with o2 and forms n2 no2 the no2 reacts with water and forms hno3 so but that will that content will be very less that percentage will be very less that's why when you condense it when you condense it you will have some acid you will have some acid some acid and gases will be there so you will have weak acid and gases will be introduced in this into this uh, uh, absorption column and air is introduced the whatever remaining whatever remaining nitro, nitric oxide gases are there that will be oxidized with the help of air here and there will be complete conversion of no2 will happen the no2 reacts with water which is coming down in this absorption column and forms the nitric uh, nitric acid that we will get the nitric acid that we will get the 
nitric acid. So I am repeating <coughs> the NO and water vapor during the uh, removing the heat, the NO can oxidize some amount of NO can oxidize and react with water and form the nitric acid. So weak nitric acid and nitric oxide gases both are supplied into this absorption tower. Two things are fed into this absorption tower from the one, one from the bottom that is air, one from the top that is cold water. So whatever nitric oxide gases which are entering into this absorption tower reacts with oxygen in the air and forms NO2. Whatever NO2 which is whatever NO2 which is produced reacts with cooling water which is coming from the top and for, forms the nitric acid. So nitric acid from here and nitric acid formed here, everything comes down as a final nitric acid product. Since we have a since we have the water is one of the water as a product here, water as product here, we will we will get the oh we will get the concentration varying from 65 to 70 percent. We will get the concentration varying from 65 to 70 percent. 65 to 70 percent. So that way we will get the sorry 52 to 65 percent nitric acid concentrate this much concentrated nitric acid we are able to produce using this ammonia oxidation process. So sorry, it's all 11 o'clock. I will just explain this one. Why are we using this in the next class? Apart from that, this is simple process industry or process flow to produce nitric acid. I hope you're able to understand and I making you some uh, or giving you some details which you are learning something. So with that, I stop here for today's class and thank you very much. If you got any questions, please do not hesitate to ask me. Somebody's query. Oh yeah. So thank you students. If you have any questions, please ask me. Otherwise, you may leave and join the next class. Please do not hesitate. If you got any questions, please ask me. I think someone unmuted and stopped. If there's questions, please ask me.